Okay. So I think we're actually going to start. Um, I just want to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rachi Schnee. I am the co-chair of the American Society of Yad Vashem Young Leaders Associates. And I want to welcome the amazing Dove Foreman, who's on here. Unfortunately, Lily couldn't make it today, but we have Dove, um, Lily um, Ebert's great-grandson, -grand, great who has single-handedly changed the world on his own. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, just one more. OK, we're. So the, about, we're going to talk about the Young Leadership for a second, and then I'm going to go into introducing Dove. Um, the Young Leadership Associates has undertaken the critical task of developing ongoing programs to promote Holocaust awareness and connect our generation to Yad Vashem's mission. We are dedicated to preserving legacy and Jewish history and carrying it forward as future leaders. We began the YLA Book Club in 2018 as a way to connect deeply to the Shoah and understand unique aspects of survivor stories. We have, these, we have these discussions in order to never forget and to keep the lessons, stories, and memories alive. Because of its enormous impact, YLA made the decision to host the discussion, but open it to the entire ASYB community. We are delighted to be joined by the author of Lily's Promise, Dove Foreman, here for this meaningful event. Dove co-authored this book with his great-grandmother, Lily Ebert. Based in London at the age of 16, Doe Foreman wanted to raise awareness of the, of, of the Holocaust and anti-Jewish sentiments. During the COVID pandemic, Doe used Twitter to share his great grandmother's story. His tweets reached over 70 million Twitter users in 2020 and 2021, that's unbelievable. Doe began to explore new ways to teach young people. And with the rise of TikTok, he created an account knowing that this is how best to reach people his own age and raise critical awareness. Dove connected with his following and provided a simple and accessible way to learn about the Shoah. He was invited to speak about social media and Holocaust commemoration to the CEO of Google at Oxford and Cambridge University and to more than 150 news outlets in over 30 countries. Dove connected, Dove has had a continued relationship with Yad Vashem, creating TikTok videos from the museum and generating a lot of important interest in our cause. To date, Dove and Lily's TikTok account has almost 2 million followers and over 32 million likes. That's unbelievable. Users get a glimpse into Lily's life as a survivor and receive answers to questions that they may have. Here's an example of a clip where a user asks the question, hi, Lily and Dove, for those who don't know, what was Auschwitz? Thank you for that. Um, a very powerful clip. Okay, so we're gonna just jump into a few questions. We're gonna ask Dove some questions here. If any participants have any questions throughout the the hour, um, you can just chat and you can just type it into the chat, and we'll get to those questions also. So, Dove, for those of us who haven't had a chance to read the book, but we're excited to join today and wanted to come anyway to hear you. Tell us a little bit about Lily's promise and Lily's story and the process of writing this book. What inspired you to write the book and why now? Um, well, firstly, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining and taking the time out of your busy schedules to, uh, to listen to this today. Um, I'm gonna start by giving just a brief overview of my great grandmother's story and the work that we've been doing together. And hopefully that will answer those questions. And if not, just please do ask them again. Um, and, and as, um, Please, as I'm speaking, feel free to write questions in the chat box and everything, and I'll try and get those um, answered as well. So being a member of what is now known as the fourth generation has always been growing up a huge part of my identity. In recent years, I've had the immense privilege of speaking alongside my incredible great grandmother about her harrowing Holocaust testimony. And I know that she is nothing short of remarkable, but I still find it hard to comprehend all that she went through during the Holocaust and the courage and the determination that she has shown throughout her life. So working with my great grandmother to educate others about the Holocaust, telling people across the world about Lily's happy childhood, her wonderful parents and siblings, and how it's all changed from the Nazis occupied Hungary 78 years ago in March, 1944, really made me want to share that story with millions, millions of other people like me who can't understand and will never understand. And so I went onto social media, 
to tell people, to teach this story. We tell people about Auschwitz-Birkenau, we tell people about slave labor camps and concentration camps. We tell people about how entire communities were destroyed. And we tell people that we are lucky that some of Lily's family survived because in other places, no one was left to remember or to mourn. We tell people about how after the Holocaust, my great grandmother Lily moved to Israel, about how she rebuilt her life. And we tell people about how proud she is of her large and loving family now with 36 great grandchildren. We currently have over 1.9 million followers on TikTok and we use social media to teach the next generation, the younger generation, my generation. In 2020, my great grandmother and I co-wrote our book, Lily's Promise, so that even more people could read from Lily's story and learn from the past. If you were to ask my great grandmother why she wrote the book, amongst many other answers, one of them would be because whilst TikTok, of course, she can share her, her videos and, and share her story, she's sure that the book will be there forever and that people will be able to pick it up and fully understand her story. And that reassures her that her story will never, ever be forgotten. And we were especially honoured that His Majesty now, King Charles III, wrote the forward to Lily's Promise. He wrote, for, he wrote movingly about the need to transform history into memory and said that for the Jewish people, the Holocaust was a personal tragedy. By the end of the Second World War, two thirds of European Jewry had perished at the hands of the Nazis. Six million innocent Jewish men, women and children murdered for no other reason than the religion they were born into. A great pillar of smoke covered all of Europe, the shadow of which remains with us still today. Yet the Holocaust was also a universal human tragedy. It was the greatest crime of man against man, during which humanity showed itself capable of incomparable inhumanity on an incomprehensible scale. Names were replaced with numbers, tattooed on forearms, as a permanent reminder of the depths to which humankind can sink and to the evil it can impart on a fellow human being. The Holocaust is a unique and dark period in human history, but its lessons must remain universal. We need to remember and we need to always speak out. We need to take a stand against injustice and intolerance wherever we see it in society. Because if we don't do this, we can never ever change the future. Working with my great grandmother to educate about her testimony over the last two years has been so special. And I've learned more about her than I ever knew before. She is a true inspiration. But the reason that I continue to share her story and that I continue to push the book and share her story on social media it's because it is now more important than ever that we learn from the incredible survivors who are unfortunately dwindling with time. We must remember their stories and we must remember the, take the time to remember those who are not able to speak for themselves. Listening to or even just learning from the story of a survivor provides you with a unique opportunity to take a small and simple action, to read a book, to listen to a TikTok video, or even to listen to an hour long Q&A and learn the story. But whilst this small action might just seem like a small action, you can at the same time be part of something much bigger and very meaningful because you will become a witness. And in doing so, you have the opportunity to allow others to become witnesses too. By creating a space for discussions and conversations focusing on the lessons learned from the Holocaust, like we're doing today, you can help to combat antisemitism, to encourage social action, but most importantly, to ensure that the lessons of the Holocaust remain universal forever. And now, if anyone has any questions, um, you're free to ask them in the comments, or I know Rachie has some, some questions to ask too. Yeah, I'm just gonna ask a few questions and then I'll go to the comment box. Um, so what was it about your childhood that made the Holocaust and your great grandmother's story such an important part of your own life? Um, it's, it's a tough question. I think that, as I said earlier in, in, in the introduction that I just gave, I always knew that my great grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. Um, it's very different from me growing up to what my mum experienced and what my grandmother, who I know is on this Zoom as well, experienced. I think when they were growing up, my great grandmother didn't want to share this story with them. She didn't tell them about the horrors of the Holocaust and what she experienced because she didn't want to inflict the pain on them, even though, of course, they knew. She didn't want them to feel that pain and, and to be hurt by it. But once my, once my mother had started to grow up, um, my great grandmother became more at ease with sharing her story with her and even took my, my mother and, and a few of her cousins to Auschwitz with her on one of her trips back. Um, but for me, it was always a part of my identity. I think my great grandmother from when we were very young realized that it would become our responsibility to share this story and that we should know it. And, and I think that's kind of not only strengthened my Jewish identity now, but also I think that's why I have such a passion to share this story because me and my great grandmother and, and many other people in the family too, we share this same mission 
to ensure that this story is never forgotten. But as His Majesty King Charles wrote in the forwards, quoting um, the late Chief Rabbi of the United Kingdom, Lord Jonathan Sachs, um, we can't allow history to say as, stay as history. It can't be his story. It can't remain as something that happened to someone else sometime else. We must convert it into memory. We must internalize these stories and understand that, yes, this is each, each story is an individual, each, each number is an individual, but it's about making that individual and internalizing that and realizing mm -hmm. that, that in, in order to make that never happen again, we have, to, we have to internalize it and share it and make sure that every single person we meet understands the horrors of the Holocaust, but not only understands it, learns from it too. Right, I think that's so important what you just said because Yad Vashem, the museum itself, um, and the whole point of its being and of the institution is that it translates to memorial and a name. And it's not just about that number six million because it's such an insane barbaric number to think about and to grasp, but it's about talking about every single individual, every world, every person was its own world. And the fact that you said that you're talking about your single, you know, great grandmother, that one story I think is so poignant. Um, so thank you for doing that. But then translating it into social media and the fact that you're her great grandmother, because I know a lot of people, um, like I'm a grandchild of four survivors. And um, I think it's so fascinating and interesting that you've had such a close relationship with her and she's your great grandmother, which I love. And I think it's amazing. Um, and you were able to harness your generation's, um, you know, amazing ability to use social media. So how did your mega TikTok platform come about and why did you feel social media was the path to take in order to share Lily's story? So it really all started on Twitter um, during the COVID Twitter. pandemic. Uh, my great grandmother it was the longest I've ever been apart from her and yes we are we were always very close. Um, she used to come for her butts um, every every few weeks and, and I think she's really much the queen of the family. As I said she has 36 great grandchildren but every single one of them looks up to her and, and kind of realizes how much there is to learn from her. Um, and every single person that, that she meets can attest to the fact that she has a smile which radiates the room. And I think um, kind of growing up, we always realised that and we, we were always very close. But during the COVID pandemic, not seeing her for around two months during the first lockdown really made me realise how much I had lost and that I really wanted to learn her story. And so I asked her to show me a few things, a few tangible things which I could share with the world on social media um, from the Holocaust, from her time in the Holocaust, which had allowed people to learn from her story. Um, and she showed me a banknote which was given to her upon liberation from the death march by an American Jewish soldier. And on this banknote, uh, sort of a, 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 like a $10 bill, just the German equivalent, um, was written 10 words of hope, the start to a new life, good luck and happiness. And the soldier had inscribed his name in Hebrew phonetics, but he couldn't really write in Hebrew, so you couldn't, make, you couldn't decipher his name. But he wrote his position in the army, the assistant chaplain Shachter. And I said to my great grandmother, I'll find this soldier within 24 hours. And, and she laughed. She thought I was joking. I probably was joking at the time. And within eight hours, two million people had seen the tweet and we were able to find the soldier. And it, wow. was, at that moment, it, it was at that moment when I realized that every single young person has a platform and can harness the power of social media, one click of a button to reach millions of people, but not only to reach millions of people, to actually make a difference. Because so often young people are told that we don't have a seat at the table and that we can't make a difference. And they're right. Obviously, at such a young age, there are things to be cautious about, especially on social media. And, and you can't, most people can't change the world at such a young age. Um, and, and but I think what I realized was that I now have a platform which can reach millions just with one click of a button. Um, and, and so that's what I did. I continued to, um, to share her story. And then eventually we moved over to TikTok. And um, the first video I posted was a video of my great grandmother in the snow. Um, when it was snowing in London just after she had recovered from COVID and that video got 400,000 views um, and, and I continued posting ever since and we kind of developed a Q&A structure where people would write questions in the in the comment boxes and we would answer them and, and that kind of when people ask why do you think you had such success on your TikTok platform I think it goes back to the point you made about Yad Vashem we don't just focus on the statistics whilst of course they're important and that's of course an important way to learn about the Holocaust you also need to focus on the personal stories and you need uh -huh. to make it personal Otherwise, people can never understand. You can't understand the number six million. Um, and so that's that's what we do. Right. Okay, amazing. I have so many questions for you. <laughs> well, first of all, is was she aware of the enormity of it all? Because I feel like sometimes it's hard to grasp unless you're on all these apps yourself, like understanding, like was she understanding exactly like the, the reach that she had? 
So I think it's hard to internalize, even for me who sees those statistics right. and the numbers that we get. I think it's very hard when when you see that 22 million people watch one video. I don't think you realize kind of the, no, the my God. Um, and the impact that that has. Um, she does understand. She knows kind of about TikTok and and people often ask me, how does a 90, she's now about to turn 99, but at the time, how does a 97 year old understand what TikTok is? Surely you're just taking videos of her and uploading them without her knowing, but that's kind of the opposite of what was happening. She definitely knew what's happening. She still does. <laughs> she knows what TikTok is. Um, she can explain it to you. And, and I think she really enjoys making these videos because not only does it reassure her that her story will never be forgotten, it also allows her to, to share these experiences and to share the human side of the Holocaust to show that Yes, the Holocaust ended in 1945, but it didn't end with that. And I think many non-Jewish people don't understand that. They think, okay, liberation, 1945, that's when the Holocaust ended. What they don't realise is that there are actually humans behind this, so then it's to go and rebuild a new life. And there's also, not to mention even the generational trauma side of things, the trauma that's passed down into families, to the daughters, the children of Holocaust survivors too. Um, so I think that's something that we also try and show with our TikTok account, the human side of the Holocaust and the effects that's had um, further down the line. And I'm sure you've gotten countless messages of people that said, I never knew that this happened, or I never knew it was this bad, or I never, you know, like, which I think is probably fuels you to continue doing this every day. Just yes, so both, both anti-Semitism and those type of comments fuel me to carry right. on going. Um, I think it's ironic. Most people would say anti-Semitism wants me, makes me want to stop doing what I'm doing. But for me, no. it only emphasizes the need to do what I'm doing and to carry on and to continue posting um, because we need to show them why, why we're doing it. And I think every single time we get an anti-Semitic comment, that is why we're on there. That's why we're educating. Amazing. And apparently I heard that you had the Prince of Wales and, and King Charles on board on the book project. So can you talk a little bit about that? So um, King Charles wrote the foreword to the book. He was at the time the Prince of Wales. Um, so just one person. Oh, um, yeah, sorry. That's what I meant yeah. now, King Charles. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I think I speak about, I did a TED Talk a few months ago and I speak about this, that young people often think that because again, in school we're taught that you can't do something huge and that you have to just focus on school and things like that. You don't think that you can kind of, they often say dream big, but they never actually encourage you to act on that. And I, I kept saying that I want at the time Prince Charles to write the forward to the book and everyone said to me it won't happen. Um, and so I decided to email Buckingham Palace with the contact that I managed to get um, and, and ask for the forward. And I think if you don't ask a knife, you don't get, of course, the famous saying. Um, and it took, it was a lengthy process. It took a few months. They obviously did a lot of background checks on all of our social media and they read the book countless times to ensure that everything was okay. Um, but eventually a few weeks before the print date, we received the forwards and I think we can't A, thank now his majesty the king enough for his support. But I think it also shows wow. the communities across the world that at such a high level, we have that support for Holocaust education. We have that support for the Jewish community. And I think that reassures us that hopefully something like the Holocaust wouldn't be allowed to happen again because we have this high level support. Well, how was that feeling when you received the forward? Was <laughs> uh, it's quite a unique feeling, one which uh, I think it was also, for me, the product of hard work coming to fruition after many months because we had, A, I was never sure that it would happen even to the last minute. You can't have any guarantees, especially with someone so high profile. So it was about kind of also, we weren't allowed to tell anyone um, so keeping that quiet and then receiving it, it was an incredible feeling. But I think every single moment of, of this process over the last now three years of working with my great grandmother, when the book was first published, the first time on live television, th there's so many moments which kind of have been not life changing for me, but kind of surreal. It's not life defining either, <laughs> but surreal moments, which I think you, as a child, you kind of dream of, of these things happening. And I still am a child. Um, but you, you dream of massive things happening to you and then to see right. them happening is, is quite surreal and it's quite incredible. I'm just going to pivot a little bit and I wanted to ask about your gram, your great grandmother, Lily, how she was able to continue on. And I know she you, you grew up in a religious family, right, and very strong Jewish values and how that was always the center focal point in her life and that she remains I don't know if she grew up religious before the war, but how she had that God fearing even after the war, a little bit about that. And also just the importance of keeping the Jewish tradition for her future generations. So it's a question which she often receives, which is about faith, both during, after and before the Holocaust. Before the Holocaust, she grew up in a very religious family. Um, she still is very religious, um, raised a family with, again, 36 great grandchildren, all of whom are religious. Um, and I think, 
people often ask her this question, how do you still believe in God after the Holocaust? You saw what God did to you and she'll say, well, God didn't do it, humans did. Um, <laughs> and that's often, that's often her response. Um, so I think I, I would share that in her name. Um, but again, each Holocaust survivor has their own, uh, own view on this, but my great grandmother kept her faith strong and she often says that having the faith kept her going every single day. And that's one of the things that, that, that got her through the war and got her through the Holocaust, Auschwitz, Birkenau. Um, where her mother, younger brother and sister were murdered, to get through that, she had to have the faith, she says. Um, and she, she often says that she doesn't understand how someone survived without the faith, because how could they have kept going? What were they holding on to? Um, and, and she has an incredible amena, and, and, and I think she's passed that on to the family. Shabbat is, is because of her, something which is so incredible. Um, spending Shabbat with her is, is so many of my friends, when she's around, come around to ask her questions, but just to be with her, because it's so special. Um, and I think it's given me a, a different outlook and appreciation on life but I think her her values were passed down to her children who passed it down to their children who who are now passing that down to their children and I'll hopefully pass that down to my own children um all because of one person who held on to that faith and that amena and I think there's there's incredible lessons to wow. be learned from that too it's so beautiful it's really amazing and it just shows again how back to that one name and one life how what what one life can build versus what like destroying one life is not just destroying one person but all yeah. the future generations like lily's un amazing family that came out of her after the war it's really incredible and also very haunting to like when you understand how much we lost um but also just thinking about um her life in in europe post-war post-war europe and she's in in, in the uk um what was her reaction over the past decade with the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe? So just for those who don't know, my great grandmother made Aliyah, as I said, and then um, moved to London in 1967. Um, and she's lived there ever since and raised her family there. Um, I think she's, like everyone, incredibly worried by the rise of anti-Semitism. But of course, we shouldn't lie to ourselves that it's not the same as it was in the 1930s. Um, I think as a Jewish community, and rightly so, we're so quick to, to make parallels between the two but I think what's also important to realize is that it's not on that level and thankfully we have the support of the government especially in England I work with the government very closely and so do many others they're very supportive of Jewish communal organizations and of course we had the scare with um, Jeremy Corbyn in 2019 and 2016 <coughs> but other than that we we thankfully have a supportive government and royal family and people um, com communities and the police and, and and all various different different organizations but she is worried I think when, once you go through something so terrible and, and, and so kind of the, the biggest crime in, in human history, and then you see that same form of, of, of racist abuse growing and rising in society every single year, I think it's incredibly scary and something which we have to be wary of. And I think what, what she would say is that, and something which I often echo her with, is that the Holocaust did not start with gas chambers. It didn't start with the final solution. It didn't start with Auschwitz-Birkenau. It started with words. It started with basic tropes and, and, and anti-Semitic images and things like that in, in newspapers. And we have to be very vigilant and aware. And wherever we see these types of anti-Semitism or any racism of all kinds, we have to stamp it out. And we have to realize that it's not okay. And at the first, very first moment, and this is direct verbatim from my great grandmother, she would tell you at the very, at the very first moment, you have to try and do something. Don't stay silent just because you think that you can't make a change. Don't stay silent, join, join the crowd, join the noise and rally against it because that's the only way you can stop something from happening again. <coughs> I mean, okay, so I'm just gonna ask a few questions from our viewers. Um, Todd says, Shalom Dov, thank you for sharing your busy schedule with everyone. On page 241, you write of the rage, the reality that Eichmann could have been stopped. Please comment on of memory after it was des desecrated at the, pit, the Bitburg Cemetery in the 1980s. How can the world move forward to heal this desecration? Um, it's a good question. I think, to be honest, I can't answer that one. Um, I'm going to pass. I wouldn't usually do that, but if I don't feel qualified to, I'm, I wouldn't answer it. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, what has yours and Lily's experience been encountering anti-Semitism in the form of anti-Zionism and TikTok? Has Lily ever addressed the importance of supporting Israel? Good so question. she has, um, she has spoken about Israel. Of course, it's something which we're wary of because we have this incredible platform of two million people and we're both Zionists, we're not afraid to say it, but you don't want to lose that platform. And I think we're in a unique position where we have to try and balance the, the amount of Zionism that we so speak about and, and the times we speak about Israel, we're very careful about what we say, just because 
people hide behind the smokescreen of anti-Zionism and are actually being anti-Semitic. And, and we wouldn't want kind of people to turn against us because of that and us to lose our platform. Um, and I think it's something which I find incredibly hard to balance and something which I, I wish there was a simple solution to, but we, we, fa we face a lot of anti-Semitism disguised as anti-Zionism. Um, and I think the best way to counter that, I know this isn't the question, but in my opinion, the best way to counter that is to teach people why anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, but also to, to make sure that people realize that we can't allow this to go unchecked, as I said before. Where if we see anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, we have to stand up to it. And something which I try and do, I never respond to these racist comments privately because there's no point because they're not going to change their mind and they spend all day commenting and, and spewing anti-Semitic and racist abuse and vile over people's social media pages. So I don't reply privately. But what we do do is we go out and we educate against that and we show why these facts are not true. Um, so that, that's that's kind of the way we counter it. And we do receive a lot of hate. Um, but we also receive a lot of love. So we always look at the positives and, and the amount of co comments of people saying that they've learned so much and that, that they're sending so many positive comments to my great grandmother. I think it's unbelievable to see. So somebody else also asked, did Lily int intentionally say kill people and not to kill the Jews in the TikTok video that we had just showed? Um, I, I don't know what her tensions were. You would have to yeah. ask. Um, but... I think what we also have to realize is that her main language, her mother tongue is Hungarian. Um, mm -hmm. So often she will say things um, which, of course, she means them, but that right, the right, right. exact might not be exactly correct um, mm -hmm. just because of, of, of the language barrier. Um, but no, I, I think it was probably that she meant to say Jews, but uh, again, I can't, I'm not sure. And what are your plans? For the future like do, do you plan on having any type of career in this in this form or any way in holocaust education where <laughs> fighting anti-semitism like how are you taking this on into the future so i'm not sure how what what career path i'll go down i'll go into whether it be holocaust education or or, or something completely unrelated but what i am sure of is that no matter what i do i will continue to share this story for as long as i can um mm -hmm. And I'll continue continue to bear witness and, and, and carry that responsibility on my shoulders, my great grandmother's story, but not only her story, the story of every single one of the six million who were murdered and also all of the survivors to ensure that these stories are never forgotten. Because as long as I have a voice, I'll use it. And I think, again, that's something which I, every time I speak to young audiences, my age, even younger, I encourage them to use their voice, their platforms, which whilst you think people might think on their Instagram page with 600 followers might not be a lot, I started TikTok with zero followers and our first video got 400,000 views. Um, <laughs> it shows that you can make a difference no matter how little or, or how little followers you have or how little experience you have. Um, and so I will continue to use my voice for as long as I have it. I'm not sure where where life will take me, um, but yeah, we'll see. And there's the question of, is Dov still in university? Um, I'm not actually yet in university. Um, yeah, I'm currently taking a year off studying in yeshiva. Um, and also doing a program in Hebrew University and the next year I hope to start university in London. Amazing, incredible. And somebody had the question, Lily tells of Jewish prisoners at, um, at the risk of, of their own lives secretly helping one another despite Nazi prohibitions. Can you say more about this little known bravery? I think she actually expands on it in the book um, and even stories about herself I mean you've seen if you've read the book you would have seen the story of when she saved her sister from almost certainly being killed in the gas chambers her sister was um in a selection sent to the line of the uh, a Nazi SS officer um had said to her join this queue and everyone knew where that queue was going that line was going to the gas chambers and, and my great grandmother instinctively pulled her sister back and said no you're not going in that line the Nazi officer never looked back didn't realize that she didn't join the line and, and she saved her sister's life. There's more, more, more accounts of this in the book where my great grandmother speaks about the time that her and also other times a few other, um, a few other um, prisoners went to steal potatoes and onions from the kitchens in Auschwitz. And that also meant almost certain death if you were caught doing that. Um, she speaks about the fact that the Nazis used to shoot down on them when they were going to, going to get these, these one potato or onion. <coughs> um, so I think there, there are numerous examples in the book and, and there, there are also historical records I mean we're speaking about Yad Vashem um, in Yad Vashem I, I was just there last week and there, there's countless countless stories there too 
um, of, of other prisoners who helped each other, whether it be in Auschwitz, also in ghettos um, and various things like that. Somebody just asked a question. How do you and Lily respond when people say something like the Holocaust could have could never happen again and treat your work as perhaps a bit, the sky is falling over the top? To be honest, I agree. Um, I don't think that the Holocaust in its same form will happen again. But that's not to say that the Holocaust, or not the Holocaust, but signs of the past won't repeat themselves. I think it would be naive in a way to think like that because we've seen um, countless other genocides since the Holocaust. Of course, they're not the same and we're not comparing, but signs of, the history do, signs of history do repeat themselves countlessly time and time again. And we've seen that throughout history, not just with the Holocaust. Um, and so I think we do have to be wary. And, and someone who says that we don't need to learn from the past again, I think would be naive because we do and, and we can't build a better future if we don't build off the experiences of the past and learn from the past. I don't think we educate with the sole purpose of thinking that the Holocaust might happen again. So that's why we do it. Um, we do it because people need to learn, not because they need to learn to stop the Holocaust from happening again. That is something as well. But also because, as I said, we need to build off these experiences and realize how we can grow and become better as a society and how we can do things better and right the next time um, and, and how we can look out for one another. And there are so many smaller lessons, smaller lessons of gratitude, appreciation of life that we can learn from the survivors, which we also want to share. So I think it's a very multifaceted way of education and there, are so, there is so much that you can learn. So I don't think we educate with the sole purpose to stop it from happening again. Of course, that's one of our aims, um, but that's not to say that we think the Holocaust with 6 million Jews being murdered will happen again. That's just to say that there are signs of the past repeating themselves. Hate, racism of all kinds is on the rise. I mean, I think we do have to be aware. We do have to be, we, we have to, we have to be vigilant and, and, and stand up to intolerance and injustice wherever we see it. And what was your biggest challenge in writing this book? Um, there, there's many challenges. I think, firstly, I was 16 years old. Not to be overlooked by people was, was one which was very hard. Um, but also to balance that with school um, and my social life as well, growing up during COVID and writing a book and, and going viral on social media, I think it's a lot to comprehend. But thankfully, I've got a great support network, not only of family, but also friends around me. Um, I think it's also a great challenge is kind of to realize that it's not about you and, and it's not, I, I never did this for myself to become, to get followers on Instagram or TikTok or to become big. I did this to, with the sole purpose to share my great grandmother's story. And I think often it's about grounding yourself and remembering that. Um, mm -hmm. But also there's of course the challenge of, of making sure that everything is historically accurate. So from the very beginning of the book, we had the Auschwitz Museum and also historians at Yad Vashem on board, making sure that every single fact that we wrote about Auschwitz, but also on a broad, on a more broad level of the Holocaust was, was correct and accurate. And we have backing of documents and everything to prove that. <coughs> and what was the most important lesson that your great grandmother taught you and that she want everyone to hear now or pass on future generations? I think I could sit here all day um, speaking about messages that I've learned from her. The most important, it's hard to pinpoint, but the most important for me is, is to realize that every single day is a blessing and that every every single small thing that you have to have gratitude for and you have to appreciate the, the appreciation of life that my great grandmother has and the positivity that she has inside of her is incredible. Something that I've never seen before. And, and actually it's something which I've only seen in Holocaust survivors. Um, and that is something which I think she would want you to learn from her the appreciation of life and to appreciate every single thing, but to be grateful for it. Um, I think that's what she would want to learn. And of course, there's the lessons of hatred and to be kind and, and, and to love each other and, and to stand up for each other. But I think one thing is the appreciation, especially of family. She lost her mother, as I said, her brother and sister in the gas chambers of Auschwitz-Birkenau, but also the appreciation, of every, appreciation and gratitude of every single small thing in life. Mm. Um. So what do you think awareness is going to look like when we have, unfortunately, when we're not going to have the survivors with us? Well, I think we've already seen the future of Holocaust education being mapped, up, mapped out in front of us. Um, the number of survivors is dwindling with time. Every single year, more and more Holocaust survivors pass away. In the UK, there are very few camp survivors who still talk about their story. I can name them on probably both of my hands. Um, and I think, so we're already seeing the future of Holocaust education map out and, and pan out as, as we speak. Um, and I think what we're doing now is one of those methods, not only through traditional forms like newspapers and, and books, 
um, written by the children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, but also and and of course through survivor testimony of, of videos and things like that. But I think social media using the survivor testimony that we have, there's 500,000 hours, I think it is, or maybe more even, um, of Spielberg testimony, which has never even been viewed other than by Spielberg himself when they were videoing them. Uh, Steven Spielberg after the after the show, after the Holocaust went round um, taking videos of more than 50,000 survivors. Um, and, and these videos are often between six and eight hours long of their full testimony. And there's so much of this testimony which has never been looked at, never been used. So to put these on social media, just imagine how much of an impact you can have. So I think there's there's so much that's still to be done, um, and there's 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 countless ways. And I think I just worked with the Al Bashem last week. They found a new Crystal Nacht album um, a month and a half ago in someone's attic, which uh, um, which offers a new perspective, the aggressor's perspective, photos of the Nazis burning shoes from inside the Nazi perspective of Crystal Nacht. And we together, me and them, we made TikTok videos about this and we shared it on the internet. And we wow. shared it on TikTok and, and tens, hundreds of thousands of people can view this. And I think that's the future of Holocaust education. Of course, the traditional forms will remain educating in schools through books, newspapers, news, but also contemporary forms, social media, book clubs, things like that online um, where we can reach more people. <laughs> and Lily was able to keep a pendant throughout the Holocaust. What did that mean to your family? Can you talk a little bit more about the artifact? Yeah, the so, um, there's a general consensus now amongst um, Auschwitz historians that my great grandmother is one of the only people, or if not the only person, to carry through um, a piece of gold with its original owner through Auschwitz. Um, my great grandmother carried through a golden pendant given to her when she was five years old for her birthday by her mother. Um, and this golden pendant, when the Nazis were coming to liquidate um, her town and put them in the in the ghettos before they were taken to Auschwitz Birkenau. Um, my great grandmother's brother um, put a hole in, in my great grandmother's mother's shoe and put some jewellery inside this hole in the heel. Um, and it, the, the jewellery remains in my great grandmother's mother's shoe um, until the day before they arrived in Auschwitz. And my great grandmother's mother said to my great grandmother, Why don't we swap shoes? Um, and, and my great grandmother doesn't know why she, her mother said this to her, but she thinks it's because her mother knew what was going to happen to her, um, that she would probably be taken to the gas chambers and that she wanted. To, to my great grandmother to have this, possibly the jewellery, who knows. Um, and that way, when my great grandmother was taken to have a real shower, they were told to undress. And usually, once they were to undress, none of the <coughs> sorry, none of their belongings would be there when they came out of the real shower. Um, but it looks like the Nazis it doesn't look like we know that the Nazis had run out of the clogs that they would give prisoners. So they let my great grandmother keep her shoes, and the jewellery stayed in that shoe until the. Um, until the heel wore out and every day she kept it in Auschwitz and then once the heel wore out she would transfer the golden pendant into the piece of bread that she got every morning she wouldn't eat the bread until the next day she'd keep the pendant hidden in the bread <coughs> um, and then eat the bread the next day and, and hide the pendant like that um, and that's how she she survived with this golden pendant which is one of the if not the only golden pendant which survived Auschwitz with its original owner um, and she wears it every single day and it's the only thing she has from her childhood Wow, that's amazing. Uh, so many of our people died because they were Jews. Do you think it's important now to learn and educate Jews to live as Jews and be proud of their Jewishness? 100%, I think that, again, it's a multifaceted question because as, as a young person, I've seen so much how young people struggle, young Jews in the diaspora, especially not in Israel, but outside of Israel, struggle with their Jewish identity, struggle to, to, to balance modernity, but also balancing, interacting with the outside world and anti-Semitism is on the rise, people are scared um, with their Jewishness. And I think one thing that my great grandmother has taught me is that so many people died and we need to strengthen the Jewish community that we have now. We need to appreciate it and we need to strengthen it. There's so much infighting and, and my great grandmother always says that, that there's there's no need for that and there really isn't. Um, and I think we do, need to, we do need to teach more Jews to be proud of who they are. Um, and to be proud of their identity. And yes, it's okay to be scared and it's okay to have fear of anti-Semitism, that's fine. Um, but that doesn't mean that you need to shy away from your Judaism. Um, I think there's there's so much to be proud of as a Jewish community. Definitely. And anti-Semitism anti is not a new thing. It's always been there. It's always gonna be there. It's always here. Um, okay, so it's, I don't know if anyone has any more questions. If anyone has any more questions, we can you can write them. Otherwise we're gonna wrap it up. I would just say if anyone feels um, like they don't want to ask now or comes up with a question after, 
Um, I'm very easy to find on social media um, and you're more than welcome to message me with a question. Well, thank you so much for being so sorry. Thank you for being so accessible, easily accessible. And really just, I think I, we have to thank you from, I think everyone here listening is just so incredibly impressed with you and how you've taken a platform like social media and only used it for the good and for educating and for meaning. It's just, un, it's unbelievable. And almost like, you know, we saw Man Montana Tucker do something similar now. And it's, it's such a huge responsibility and it's, it's un incredible to take a platform like TikTok because it really does reach all these millions of especially like teenagers and that age group that would never have never met a Jew before a lot of them mm -hmm. so you're not only spreading Holocaust education awareness but you're also teaching them about just being a Jew and and who you are and how you're such an eloquent refined brilliant young man so thank you so much for that um so thank you for your impactful words. And of course, for sharing your great grandmother's story with us. It's through events like these and hearing stories like Lily's that we unite as a community and ensure a younger generation will never forget. Thank you for using your platform for good, like I was saying before, and for standing up for the Jewish community in a way that promotes love, understanding, and togetherness instead of hate. If you are interested in becoming more involved with American Society of Yad Vashem, please reach out to Donna Shakarthi. We will put a year her email address in the chat now. We also have two important events coming up. This Monday, November 21st at 7 p.m., we are screening Reckonings in partnership with the JCC in Manhattan. And on November 30th at 12 p.m., we'll be having a virtual conversation with CNN anchor Wolf Blitzer for our series, Lessons from Our Parents. We also just released um, Lessons from Our Parents with Diane von Furstenberg. Um, so we hope to see you again soon. And thank you all for joining. If anyone has some last minute questions or anything else, um, if you want to and say something, um, feel free, Dove. Well, I would just say thank you everyone for listening and for coming and for the questions. And again, if you do want to reach me, um, I'm not that hard to find. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone. And thank you to Yad Vashem for hosting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks Dove. Are writing in the chat also now. Thanks again.